I'd like to talk about getting unstuck. If one realizes his position, he'll most certainly wish to remedy it as quickly as possible. If you are in a frying pan and you start to realize that it's getting hot, whoa, whoa, oh, whoa, oh, oh, you start to bounce around a little bit, you'll try to get out of that frying pan as quickly as possible. So if you realize your position, if you begin to understand your position, you'll try to get out of the position that you're in. If one realizes the position that we are in in this life, one will try to get out of that position as quickly as possible. That's my point. The hypnotism of life and our love of sleep effectively keep us from that realization. Why is it that people don't get out of the frying pan? Because they don't know they're in a frying pan. They're sleeping, they're hypnotized to believe that they're really not in a frying pan, that this is a lovely feather bed and that everything, and it's not really hot, it's really just toasty and just right with this down comforter and it's chilly outside and oh, it's so wonderful in here and oh, I just don't want to get out. Look at the smiles on their faces. Oh yes, that sounds good. I like that. I want some of that, please. Well, you can have it if we make it past those roadblocks, hypnotism of life, our love of sleep, then we're faced with more in life. More. What are we faced with? Well, we're faced with some choices that we didn't have before. So we're faced with more. More choices, more realizations, more opportunities, more of everything. Because we have increased our consciousness, our world has become more. It has become greater. It has become more meaningful. We can't take in new impressions unless, first of all, we have new impressions of ourselves. The first thing that has to happen is we have to have new impressions of ourselves. It won't do any good for me to have new impressions of you. Well, I've got some new impressions of you. Oh, that's wonderful. That's like uh, saying, well, Tom Cruise just married somebody else. Oh, that's nice. Or pick whomever, you know, Brad Pitt, I guess, is one of them, too. Who? Well, he just got a new girlfriend, or he just married somebody else, or... They just change partners. Well, yeah, that's, that's news. I can see we're all excited about that. And why is it we're not excited about that? Because that's, that's really not a new impression, is it? That's just like as the world turns. There's really nothing new about that. That's what they do. They change partners all the time. Why do they do that? Well, because they keep on thinking that that's it. This is what's going to make me happy. They have no understanding of what it is that makes us satisfied or unsatisfied. And it's not that stuff out there. It's not life. It's not the things that happen in life. It's something in our inner world that happens. We certainly can't get new impressions of others without new impressions of ourselves. So we're not really going to get new impressions of other people unless we first get new impressions about ourselves. So even if new impressions about other people would do us some good, they won't do us any good because we're not going to get any. And we're not going to get any until first we get new impressions of ourselves. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means I've got to wake up a little bit. If I wake up a little bit, just a little bit, I'll start to get new impressions. I'll broaden my consciousness. I'll expand my awareness. I'll become aware of more things. When I am aware of more things, I will have more impressions to feed upon. And then some of those impressions may actually be about myself, because self-awareness is what we're talking about. What this work doesn't teach, what this work does not teach, is leaving oneself out of the equation and starting with others. This work does not teach, oh, we start with them. We start with fixing them. No, this work teaches we start here. It all starts here. It starts with me. Well, you have a problem? Yes, you have a problem. What's your problem? Well, that person over there, no. This work teaches your problem is you, not that person over there. This is why this work is not popular. You can't go to a marriage counselor with this work. You know what a marriage counselor with this work? You go to the marriage counselor who's in this work, and you're in this work, and you say, well, my wife, blah, 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 blah. And he says, so? Well, but she, blah, 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 blah. Uh-huh, so? Well, so somebody needs to make her, blah, 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 blah. <sighs> well, that's not what we do here. You're the problem. I don't like that. <laughs> well, learn to like it, because that's what this work is about. If you're going to make any progress in this work, you're going to have to learn to like that, or at least stop disliking it. I'm not going to ask you to like it. I'm not going to ask you to like suffering. Oh, I love suffering. It's just so wonderful. I'm not going to ask you to like suffering. I'm going to ask you to stop disliking it so much. At least that turns you in the direction you need to be pointed. And maybe you'll get sucked along toward that by the sheer magnetism and the power of the idea. That's really what happens. I mean, it sounds silly. 
but it's really what happens. The power and the magnetism of the idea kind of sucks us toward it once we have faced it, once we have brought it into our awareness. That's why this work says that help comes from higher centers, from outside of you, from above you, which of course means within you. Well, why doesn't it say that? It does say that. It says both. And you're asked to understand. You're asked to apply some effort and to understand that in means up, and up means in, in this work. That higher means inner, further in, and that further in means higher up. Oh, why do I have to make effort? You don't have to make effort. You can stay just the way you are. You can be satisfied with yourself just the way you are. And you don't have to make effort, and that's fine. If you can be satisfied with yourself just the way you are, take the money and run. That's what I have to say to you. If you can be satisfied just the way you are, thank all that is holy. Take the money and run because you are a rare individual. You are either dead or so asleep that a doctor couldn't tell you from dead. You know, back in the old days, they didn't know how to tell if somebody was dead. They buried people alive. They'd hold a mirror up to their mouth to see if there was any hawing on the mirror to see if they were alive, because you couldn't tell. You didn't know how to tell. I'm not sure we know how to tell now, but we think we do. That makes all the difference. We think we know so much now. It's amazing to me how arrogant we are as a society, as a culture, as an era, as a whole race of people on this planet who think we know so much. And we're discovering now that there's a very strong possibility that 2,000, 3,000 years ago, there was manned flight on this planet. Civilizations actually had airplanes. They have found models that when they build them to scale, they fly. The Mayans had them thousands of years ago. And they made little brooches, little pins. At least that's what people thought they were, little pins or brooches, little pieces of golden jewelry. And they took those little pieces of golden jewelry that some people looked at and they thought, oh, there's those are insects. And somebody said, well, I don't think so. It really looks like an airplane. So he built one to scale, and it flew, literally flew. It was like... Okay, and then they took one that they found the, the Egyptians, one that they found of the Egyptians, a little model bird, and uh, they built it to scale and flew it, flew. It was aerodynamically sound. So they had, oh, well, of course, we would say in our great arrogance, well, they had accidentally stumbled on the law of aerodynamics without ever knowing it. Well, of course, they could never know anything. We're the only ones who could ever know anything. In our arrogance and in our incredible superiority, and our incredible lack of respect for anything other than our own wonderfulness. We couldn't possibly admit that anybody else could have ever. I mean, we all know that the pyramids were not really built by the Egyptians. It was space people. Because we could not admit that anybody who came before us could have ever had anything that we don't have now because we are the greatest. Oh, well, let me not rant about that as I am doing <laughs> We've got to begin to change ourselves before any change in the outer world of people and events can take place. That's the foundation upon which this work rests, that we have got to make some change in here before anything out there is going to change. Satisfaction is the great enemy here. When we're satisfied with ourselves, it's difficult to understand what self-change means. <laughs> if you're satisfied with yourself, what does self-change mean? If you're satisfied with yourself, the only change that you're looking for is the change that needs to happen in other people and in things. Well, the president needs to change. The Congress needs to change. The laws need to change. My wife needs to change. My kids need to change. The teacher at school needs to change. The way that guy's driving needs to change. The way the police are running things needs to change. The way the uh, water company is charging for water needs to change. The way the electric company is producing electricity needs to change. The way the oil companies are gouging everybody needs to change. But I don't need to change. I'm satisfied with myself. All the rest of it needs to change. Then I could be happier. But right now I'm pretty happy. And the reason I'm pretty happy is because I'm pretty good. It's all those other people that need to change. So satisfaction is a great enemy. Thus it's difficult to get new impressions. As long as this thing... This thing called oneself, as long as this thing remains the same, we take in only stereotyped impressions of people and things in the world. Everything's stereotyped. Everything's already preordained. Everything's already fixed. We can't have anything new. We'll just have the same old thing. Well, what has so-and-so got to say today? Oh, uh, you know, same old thing, what they always say. Now, what is the problem here? Is the problem so-and-so, or is the problem the person receiving the impressions? Well, the problem's so-and-so. The problem is the person receiving the impressions. 
who isn't really receiving any new impressions, they're receiving stereotyped impressions. They're receiving the same impressions they always receive. Why? Because they have a problem, not because that person has a problem. Upon what do impressions fall? What is the receiver of impressions? Upon what do they collect? Damp outside today, there's a mist falling. And I look outside and I notice that my car that I just had washed the other day is now being misted upon. It's getting wet. And there are little leaves falling out of that noxious tree out there. And they're landing on the car that's now wet. And they're sticking to it. And when it dries, when the sun comes out and it dries, it's going to leave little marks all over the car. And my perfectly washed car is now not perfectly washed. But I noticed that underneath the car, it's dry. So the impressions, the little mist, the little droplets of water, are falling on and collecting on my car, but not underneath it. So upon what do impressions fall? Upon what do they collect? That's really our question. What is it that's receiving them? My car is receiving the water droplets. What's receiving the impressions? One's level of being is the receptive thing on which impressions fall. It's one's level of being. Your level of being is what collects impressions. And that's why people's impressions are different, because people's levels of being are different. That's why we have such a thing as a pessimist and an optimist. A pessimist is someone who collects certain kinds of impressions, and an optimist is someone who collects another kind of impression. Oh, they take the same impressions. Here's a glass of water, and it's partially full, or it's partially empty. I guess I just let it slip out of the bag, which one I am. Where are the impressions fall on me? It's partially full, not partially empty. But someone else may look at it and say, well, it's partially empty. Half full, half empty. So you know the story. And it's about impressions. We hear it, but we don't easily understand it. We easily forget it. Well, what? Anything. Anything that matters. We hear it. We hear these ideas, but we don't easily understand them. Because the impressions are falling on little mechanical centers. Little divisions of mechanical centers. Because that's where we live. Because it takes so much less effort to live mechanically than it does consciously. Well, what did he have to say today? Oh, you know, the same old, same old. He's always the same. It's just the same old story. I've heard that story a hundred times. I'll bet you've never heard that story. Not once in your life. I'll bet you've never heard that story. I'll bet you've heard words. But I'll bet you've never allowed the impressions to really touch you so that you understood the person understood where they were coming from, understood about them, understood about the story, and let it feed you on a totally different level. Because that's not the way people who do that talk. They don't say, oh, you know, the same old, same old. They don't speak in stereotypical terms. People who are awake don't talk like that. People who are in this work don't do that. People who are in this work obviously do that. But they don't do it when they're awake. They do it when they're mechanical, when they're asleep. We live with a person called ourselves... We take this person as ourselves. <laughs> this is a strange concept. We don't make any distinction between this person and ourselves. But we are living with this person that we're calling ourselves. There's a stranger in our house, and we don't know who the stranger is and who we are. Don't think that I've come to bring peace on earth, someone said, for I've not come to bring peace but a sword. He went on to say a man's enemies will be the members of his own household, and he wasn't talking about who's living in this house at this address. He was talking about who's living in this house, this body, this consciousness. He was talking about the members of this household, the eyes that live in here, the different personalities that live in here, the fragmented, fractured self that lives in here, and the different facets of that self. That's what he was talking about. I didn't come to bring peace to this house. I didn't come to unify this house. I came to divide this house so that a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Because first, you have to divide so that you can understand what is what and where things go. And then, later, you can bring things together. But first, we must divide. First, we must separate. The sword of truth, which of course is light, consciousness, which is the light of consciousness, esoterically, the sword of truth is... It's that which parts, that which divides. Think about what a knife or a sword or a blade does. It separates. 
If you have a piece of bread and you take a knife and you slice it across the bread, you have then two pieces of bread. It has separated the bread. It has divided the bread into two pieces. And this is the purpose of the truth, to divide, to separate. So when the Bible or esoteric teachings talk about sword or knife, that's what they're talking about, the ability to divide. And what is it really that has the ability to divide? Well, discernment, judgment, but that has to come from consciousness. You can't discern without consciousness. So you have to have light. So light is that which gives you the opportunity to discern. Once you have light and you can see something, then you can begin to bring in truth, the sword, to divide between what's pleasant and what's unpleasant, what's good and what's not good, what's light and what's dark, what's needed, what's not needed, what's desired, what's not desired. Unless this separation has begun, the interaction of the work can't operate in us. Unless we begin to divide in ourselves, between ourselves and this person living in us called ourselves. Unless that has happened, this work is meaningless. Unless we have beginning there, this work is meaningless. What could it possibly mean? It can't mean anything to a person satisfied who is one. It can only mean something to someone who is already two. They recognize that there's something else inside of them over which they have no control. That's a harsh reality to have to deal with. But it's where we begin, or we don't begin. Personality has to be separated from essence. I must separate from Parkinson. You must separate from Norman. You must separate from Christensen. We've got to make this distinction. I am not Parkinson. Parkinson is what the world has built up. It is an acquired personality. It's what everything that he ever met collected and built up, like a snowman, like a dirt snowman that was rolled through whatever it rolled through, it picked it up, and it became part of it. And so no matter how deeply you dig into the snowman, you'll find more and more layers and layers and layers and layers and layers, overcoats, as it were. And that's what Parkinson is. A new impression of oneself is necessary for this to even begin to happen. You've got to have a new impression of yourself. You've got to be able to, you've got to be able to see this. You've got to be able to really see this without identifying and just say, well, yes, that's, that's, that's that and this is this. A complacent man isn't likely to get unstuck from his inner situation because he's satisfied with himself. Yesterday I talked about complacency and being satisfied with yourself a little bit. Yesterday I talked a little bit about complacency and being satisfied with yourself, not being satisfied with yourself a little bit. When we're satisfied with ourselves, we're satisfied with ourselves. It's not satisfied a little bit. We're satisfied. We're happy to stay the way we are. And a lot of people do it in different ways. Some people are just satisfied because they're so wonderful. Other people are satisfied that they're miserable, horrible, terrible people and they'll never be able to change. There's no hope for them. But you see, there's no difference. Well, I'm not going to try. Well, why am I not going to try? I'm not going to try because there's no hope for me. I'm a wreck. I'm ruined. I just forget it. There's no way. So they don't try. That's satisfaction. That's self-satisfaction. It's complacency. It's the exact same thing. It doesn't matter to me whether you're lifting yourself up or whether you're putting yourself down. It's the exact same thing because it has the exact same result. You don't work. You don't do anything. You don't change. You don't move. Which, of course, is a lot like our question that we had this morning. I don't work when I have the opportunity because I don't understand blah, 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 blah. No, that's not why you don't work. It's not for that reason that you don't work. We don't work because we're satisfied with ourselves. That's why we don't work. There's no other reason not to take an opportunity. There's only one reason not to take an opportunity to work. We're satisfied with things the way they are. It's not worth the effort it will take to change something. That's the real truth. So you see, a person who is in that situation is stuck inside of himself. In a sense, all of us are stuck to something, and we need to get unstuck. The problem is, it's nothing about things we can see or handle. It's not where we're stuck. I'm not stuck on my car. I'm not stuck on my piano. I'm not stuck on my house. I'm not stuck on the... Now, of course, some of us are. Some of us are stuck on those things. You, know, you get a new car, and you go and you park it out on the south 40 of the parking lot, and you're just as happy as can be because there's nobody going to open their door into your car and put a big dent in it and a scratch in it, and it's going to be wonderful. Your car is just going to be safe out there. And then you see you're, you're just getting in the door, and you turn around and take one last look at your beautiful, wonderful, shiny, attractive new car, and you see rolling down toward it a shopping cart that got away from somebody. 
And you look at it and you can see there's no way you're going to make that 200 yard dash out there to stop that shopping cart, which is nine feet away from your car and it's going to hit the side of it. And you know what it's going to do. What do you do? Well, you agonize is what you do. You rage at whoever was stupid enough to leave that shopping cart there. You think about who you can sue. Who's going to pay for this? Well, I've got insurance, but the deductible, and on and on and on, you're insane with it. There's a problem there, people. <laughs> well, maybe the problem is, yeah, the problem is whoever left that shopping cart go. No, that's not what we're talking about. See, you haven't begun to work then. You're still looking out there for the answer. You haven't begun to work yet. The answer's in here. The problem is in here. It's in the person taking the impressions in. It's not in what the impressions are, who's delivering the impressions, or who let the impression go when they should have been holding on to it. That's not what it's about. The problem is it's not about the things we can see or handle. It's all invisible. It's in this invisible world in which we live. This work is about this invisible world. What separations are necessary in it? What direction must be taken in it? We need to learn how to navigate in this invisible world, this world that because we've been glued to the senses and glued to out here for so long, we hardly even know that this other world exists. We know how to get from here to there in this outer world. We have maps, we have GPS, we have satellites, we have all kinds of things. Pull into a gas station. If you're not a man, you can ask for directions. And somebody will give you the wrong directions on how to get where you think you want to go, and then you'll end up somewhere else. <laughs> and they'll be laughing at it. <laughs> that guy is probably in Hoboken by now. You get the idea. It's the invisible world in which we live that we need to see what direction must be taken. We find it difficult to understand that it matters with which thoughts and feelings we identify, to which thoughts and feelings we say, I. But that's all that matters. That matters more than how much money you have in your bank account. That matters more than where you live. That matters more than what you drive. That matters more than who you're married to. That matters more than anything. But we find it very difficult to believe that and understand that because we're so glued to this outside world. It matters which thoughts and feelings we identify, with which we identify, to which we say I. Work effort begins with becoming conscious of this invisible world in which one is. We're in this invisible world. We're in it. That's it. Now, we need to become conscious of it. If you're not conscious of it, then you need to become conscious of it. If you are conscious of it, you need to become more conscious of it. We've got to observe ourselves from the knowledge of what this work says. If you don't have the knowledge of what this work says, then you can't rightly observe yourself. How can you know what you're looking at unless you're told where to look, what to look for, given a couple of clues of what it's going to look like? so that when you see it, you will recognize it. In other words, recognize it, bring it to your consciousness again, which is what recognize means. A man must divide himself in two before he can shift from where he is psychologically. This is the premise of this work. Look, you first got to divide yourself in two. You first got to see that there is Parkinson, this thing that this world has built up. And then there is me, this other unknown thing to me. It's unknown to Parkinson. It's barely known at all. And the work, teaches us about what it is. It teaches us how to look for it. it. teaches us how to discern between it and Parkinson. So that's the knowledge that we need. And then we can make the separation. And once we can make the separation, then psychologically we can begin to work. We've got to realize that people and ourselves are not merely somewhere in space and time, rich or poor, tall or short, young or old, fat or skinny, black or white. We've got to see that they are more than that. Each is somewhere at some level in this invisible psychological world that we're talking about. Then ask, where are you? Ask yourself and then notice, where are you? You should be able to locate yourself in your internal world, like the little map at the mall that says you are here with a red arrow, so that you can locate yourself. And then you have a point of reference. If you are here, then you can see that Macy's is there. Then you can see that Dunkin' Donuts is there. I know everybody wants to know where Dunkin' Donuts is. I can tell by looking at you. All right, Baskin Robbins. How's that? Did I get everybody then? I got you on Baskin Robbins. I didn't have her on the Dunkin' Donuts, but I got her on the Baskin Robbins. I can see her take the hook. Oh, this is fishing. You throw out a hook or you throw out a net and you see what you pull up. Then you throw it out again and you see what you pull up. Because if I can't connect with you, what, what are we doing here? What are we doing? If I can't throw out a hook and catch you, what are we doing? 
Do you not want to be caught? And what are you doing here? Do you not want to be pulled into the boat? Think about it. Do you not want to be pulled into the boat? I do. I want to be pulled into the boat. I want help. I want something to help me out of this. Isn't that why you're here? Unless you see something of what is meant here, what we're talking about, you can't really begin to work. This whole idea of self-complacency really has to be understood. You've got to see. Yes, and, and when we see, we see, we begin to observe ourselves, and the first thing we see is, oh no, it's impossible. I'll never make it. But it's not up to you. It's up to you only to work. One of the questions we have is, why work if we're not working for results? Because it's the right thing to do. That's why. Because you don't have any choice. What else are you going to do? You're going to go back out there? Is that what you're going to do? If you think you are, then I recommend that you do it. And go. Do it now. Do yourself the greatest favor that you can do yourself. Get out. Go do it. Don't talk about it. Don't think about it. Do it. And if you can do it, if you can pull it off, if you can go back to sleep, then like I said, thank everything that's holy. Because you're a rare individual. You're either dead or you're soon to be dead. And if you're dead, well then, pff, dead chickens. Don't squawk when you pluck them. You can't suffer. But if you're at a place where you're just having trouble believing that you could possibly make it, that's a great place to be. Because it's not up to you. It's up to you to make the effort. It's up to the light to heal you. It's up to the light to cure you. It's up to the work to draw you along. It's up to something higher than you to get the job done. For me, that's a very comforting awareness.